so that we can Oh, that's nice to know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a bit of a discussion in regard to COP26. As you know, a big discussion happening of the Conference of the Parties in Glasgow right now where we're discussing, um, of course, the, the Paris Agreement in 2015 and commitments made by various countries. But to tonight, we're really talking about the implement implications of that to the Gippsland and what we're doing. And as I said, we're very happy to have with us a number of excellent speakers and beginning those speakers, of course, will be Darren. But before we go to that, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is a webinar. So it's a little bit different. Your, your video and your microphone won't be on. Hopefully you can hear me uh, and, uh, and see me. Uh, during the night, if you want to chat to each other, there's a chat function down the bottom. And if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A button down the bottom. We won't be able to answer your hands going up and things like that. But if you put a question in the Q&A, we do have a panelist session a bit later on and uh, we'll use those questions later. Darren, we're going to start with you. Um, Darren, th firstly, thanks, mate. Thanks for coming on board tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Um, firstly, your reflections in regard to um, COP26, and I guess in terms of the environmental discussions that we're having um, here in Gippsland. Um, I should say right from the start, we've I've been particularly impressed by a lot of the comments that you've made and your leadership in regard to your party in terms of its environmental progress. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts tonight in terms of what the implications are for Gippsland. Well, well thanks, Darren. Just give me a thumbs up. You can hear me loud and clear. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. And like you, I, I recognise the traditional owners of the land we gather on this evening. I'm, I'm the Gunai Kurnai country myself. And with a beautiful... Um, Snow River floodplains behind me, you can all see. Um, look, I'll keep my comments pretty brief, Darren, and allow plenty of time for questions and um, a good broader conversation. The, the few comments I will make is my concern with the, the climate debate at a national level is that we've created a level of climate anxiety in our community amongst younger people in particular, where we haven't always balanced the debate to give them a bit of hope as well. So I am concerned about, yes, there are obviously some really significant challenges here we need to face and, and Australia needs to do its share in terms of um, reducing its emissions and, and caring for future generations. But I think we also have a responsibility to make sure younger people in the community in particular can have some level of confidence and hope for the future. So the first few points I would make is that Traditionally, over the last 10 or 15 years, this has been an incredibly vexed issue in federal parliament. It's been the killing fields for leaders of the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, and um, it has been a, a difficult issue for some reason for the federal parliament to grapple with for a whole, whole range of factors. For us as a nation, though, I think we can take a little bit more optimism, a little bit more confidence out of the fact that we have acted to reduce our emissions. When we've signed up international agreements, we've met our commitments, whereas other countries have often signed up and not necessarily fulfilled uh, their side of the bargain. We have reduced our emissions faster than countries such as Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the United States, but we don't pretend there's not more work to be done. Uh, we're on track to meet our, our um, commitments for 2030, which was 26 to 28% from our 2005 levels. And the Prime Minister told the conference in Glasgow last week it's more likely to be a 30 to 35 percent reduction by 2030, which I think is a is a positive announcement. And after a somewhat um, interesting process to watch unfold in the media, we got to a net zero um, emissions by 2050 commitment as well, and the National Party Room supported that. So for the first time in my time in Parliament, so that's 13 years, you've got the Liberal, Labor, and National Party. So the three most significant parties in terms of numbers in the House of Representatives, all agreeing on a net zero emissions by 2050. Now, there's some, there's obviously uh, going to be more debate, I guess, around midterm targets, and that's uh, probably going to be part of the whole election campaign at some point in the next year or so, or next next few months or so. But from a Gippsland perspective, that's important because the industries that I talk to and deal with, above all else, tell me they need they need certainty, policy certainty, and and know where, where the nation's heading in terms of its targets. Now, for us in Gippsland, we obviously have been an energy powerhouse, whether it's oil and gas or, or brown coal-fired power stations in the Trove Valley, but we're also a food and fibre powerhouse. Um, you know, we produce an enormous amount of food for Australia and the rest of the world, and we're heavily exposed when it comes to industries like uh, manufacturing, 
and also our transport task makes us quite large emitters per head of population. And, and I mentioned that per head of population, which you'd all be well aware of. Australia, as a percentage of total global emissions, is obviously not the biggest kid on the block. We're somewhere around one and a half percent of total global emissions. But per capita, we are quite big emitters. We, and that's some of it's due to our transport tasks, some of it's due obviously to our reliance um, on the fossil fuels uh, traditionally. But what we're seeing, I think, and some of this is happening, I mean, despite government um, uh, uncertainty in, in a policy sense, what we're seeing is industry and um, technology moving so quickly that Australians are, uh, are being quick to adapt in terms of their individual household level. I mean, I think, I'm not sure the exact figures, but we're one of the highest, if not the highest per capita uh, take up of, of rooftop solar, which is a positive thing to see people taking that step. Things that I'm concerned about, Darren, is what does that then mean to our more centralised model of energy that we've had, uh, energy um, um, generation we've had in the past, when we start having a more decentralised model where more of us producing power on our own rooftops making sure the transmission capacity is still there to ensure that reliability and affordability and security of supply. So there's some of the, I think the, there's some of the real practical challenges we face as we all, as we all adopt a more uh, decentralised model of energy generation. The, I'll just briefly, and I guess, um, Darren, with the, um, the broader policy announcement the government has made in terms of its approach to meeting its 2050 targets, the, the technology not taxes uh, uh, policy the Prime Minister outlined is, is more than a slogan. I know it's a three-word slogan. We, we love those in politics. But it actually is backed up by what's actually occurring on the ground right now. The federal government has committed $20 billion by 2030. The expectation is that we'll leverage additional $60 billion worth of expenditure uh, by industry and households as we, as we continue to reduce our emissions. We're seeing evidence of that already here in Gippsland. We're seeing uh, with the hydrogen energy supply chain project at Loyang, which is a joint venture project involving Japanese government, the Australian federal government, Victorian government, and various business consortia uh, working to see whether they can make it viable to transform our brown coal resource into a liquid and hydrogen for transport and actually export it to Japan. And on top of that, you're seeing a lot of work going on in our own area in terms of carbon capture and storage. It's regarded as something of a, um, a holy grail, I guess, for those who are still involved in the fossil fuel industry. The, the critics say it's not going to work and not going to get industrial level uh, capacity. But the research is showing they can achieve carbon capture and storage. And if, if that's possible, uh, then obviously some of the fuels we're currently using would still have a, have a role to play uh, in the next few decades. I guess the question on carbon capture and storage, though, is whether the advantages or the developments in battery technology associated with solar will outpace uh, the carbon capture and storage uh, development. So I'll, I'll let, sorry, one other point I would make, uh, Darren, in terms of industries that are exposed in our community, agriculture is obviously an industry which is very important to Gippsland. It's an industry which um, has uh, significant exposure when it comes to any emissions reductions targets. The work being done in terms of soil carbon and giving and, and being able to measure that accurately and be able to achieve credits for soil carbon is an exciting area for the agricultural sector, uh, just as forestry, um, sustainable harvesting of, of timber is regarded as being a potential uh, positive for us here in Gippsland. There's real opportunities for us if there is a market there uh, that um, rewards or provides a level of economic security for our farmers uh, in terms of the abatement capacity of the agricultural sector or the, or the forestry sector. So it's, it's not, certainly not all downside when we talk about uh, the challenges across Gippsland. We've been an, you know, an energy, a food, a fibre powerhouse for decades. I think they will continue into the future. They'll just require a more uh, advanced technology and, and changes in the way we've done business in the past. And I guess that takes me right back to where I started my opening comments. I think it's incumbent upon those of us who take on uh, local, state or federal government leadership roles to try to work collaboratively uh, and to try and reassure younger Gippsland in particular that there will be opportunities for them in the future. So thanks for the opportunity to join you this evening. And, and thank you, Darren. Um, you, you're absolutely right in terms of that positive um, message for Gippslanders and, and, and you mentioned the agricultural sector as being one and we're going to have Sandra talk to us a little bit later on about some of the things that she's doing. I remember the first time I heard about Star of the South was actually in your office and uh, offshore wind and, and places like that. There, there is a lot of industries looking to set up in Gippsland uh, renewables. Are, are you excited by those? 
Yes, sorry, Dan, and I should have um, I should have actually made some notes and referred them. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> uh, Star, Star of the South and um, the Mariners Project. So the Mariners yes. Project is, is, is a linking project to uh, link Victoria to the uh, hydro um, resources in Tasmania. But the Star of the South, it seems to me, uh, one of those projects that has an enormous amount of potential, and that's what the legislation before the Parliament uh, only last week set up a structure for offshore wind production. And to looking at things to make sure it can coexist with the commercial fishing industry. Uh, I like, you know, wind farms have tended to be a little bit divisive on land. I think they're more likely to be more uh, uniting uh, when they're in a, in a you know, marine environment because there's less issues with individual landholders. Um, but and one thing we have got plenty of in Bass Strait is a wind resource. And if, I mean, we are blessed. We are. We've got to keep reminding ourselves we are so blessed in Australia in the sense that we have relied heavily on on fossil fuels and also the resource sector, but there are other resources around solar resource and wind resource and water resource for hydro, pumped hydro are enormous. Mm. So we do have a, a real a real competitive advantage to some of our, um, our export partners. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. Darren, they were wonderful comments. I know you've got to go by 7.30, but we, we would like to keep you on board if we can for a little while. And we've got a couple more questions for you. And what I'll do is get you to switch your video off if you could and mute yourself. Um, I want to introduce Jarrah Hicks to come back to us. We've been talking on a more global scale in terms of what the nation's doing. But Jarrah has been a co-founder of the uh, Community Power Agency and is really good at working with local communities to develop their own innovative community energy projects. Uh, we welcome her to the webinar to talk a little bit about how the people of Gippsland can get involved in this revolution. Chara. Sure, thanks, Darren. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, I'm joining you tonight from the lands of the Biripai people. I live in um, mid-north coast of New South Wales. I'm just gonna get my screen up here. I'm gonna share mostly some photos um, and tell you some stories from Australia and also across the world um, about the power of communities getting involved and driving the transition to renewable energy. It's made a massive difference in other countries and it's really picking up here in Australia as well. And there's a lot of activity in Gippsland and the Community Power Hub has been at the centre of that activity. So I'll just share a few stories with you and I'm really aimed here at talking about um, giving people some hope giving people some context for why it's important for us to take action together and the power and the impact that we can have when we take action together as, as a community. Just want to quickly share a story about, um, can you all see, oh, hang on, I haven't entered presenter mode yet. There we go. I hope you can, um, hope you can see a picture there of a, a lovely snowy tree. Um, Darren, just I'm sorry, Jerry. Yeah, we're we're in the yeah. uh, we're we're in the wrong mode there. If you might just flick it over to to the other mode. So you can see. Sorry. Yeah, you were in presenter mode. All right. Okay. Just one moment. My apologies. Is that better? Uh, no, we're still in presenter mode. Just need to swap the displays. Yeah, I, oh, right, there we go. Got you. Got you now? Is that no, right? No, we might just stick with it. It'll be fine. Oh. There it is. Yes, there it is. Well done. Okay. Fantastic. Sorry about that little hiccup, everybody. So here we go. Imagine that we are in um, snowy, snowy, cold Denmark. It's the middle of winter and it's the late 1970s and people are feeling really concerned because there's an oil crisis going on and they currently rely on oil for a majority of their heating needs. And winter goes for many, many months of the year and it's devastatingly cold and oil is really an essential thing to, to get by in life in, um, in Denmark in wintertime. And so people started talking about this problem and coming together to create solutions. And one of the solutions that came up in um, the late 70s was the idea of wind turbines and putting their incredible wind resource to good use. And what you can see here is from the Folklore Museum in Northern Denmark. And these are literally the first prototypes of the modern wind turbine um, of, of electricity generating wind turbines. So taking that heritage of the wind, um, the turbines to grind grain and make, putting, those, putting 
turbines to use to, to create electricity. So these are their turbines made out of wood and fiberglass and literally made by backyard, you know, backyard engineers with the support of their communities and the funding of their communities. And from that early start um, is, is the beginning of the wind industry. So communities coming together, forming cooperatives to co-own those very first turbines. That's how this technology began. And now the technology, of course, is playing a massively valuable role in our transition to renewable energy. Um, and it's communities that owned a lot of the, the first wind farms in Germany and in Denmark. And together, played a really important role in getting the, re the renewable energy transition established. So just, just a couple of figures that I'll pull out that um, in Germany, hundreds of thousands of people are involved in owning um, shares in wind farms, but also in bioenergy plants and solar farms. Um, and in Denmark, these figures are a bit old now, but um, back 10 years ago, when the renewable energy transition was really just starting, um, Denmark had 20, over 20% of its electricity from wind power 10 years ago, and 25% of that capacity was owned by the community. And so what that meant was communities were not only helping get kickstart the transition, they were also making decisions about the wind farms and how, how they were to be developed and how they contributed to the community. And they also got the financial benefit of owning that technology together. So a real role for communities to get involved um, in the transition and through being involved to bring a whole range of benefits. And I think one of the key benefits is that sense of the power we can have when we work together. We need, we need to be strong in um, campaigning against things that, that we are no longer of use to us. So campaigning um, against, we need to say no to certain things, but we also need to have things that we're saying yes to. And we need to have the solutions um, and have things that we can turn our eye to and, and get inspired and get hopeful and get active. Um, and so community energy is a really fantastic opportunity for that. We know now in terms of renewable energy, it, renewables is now the cheapest form of new build power station. So if we're going to build a new power station, it's most likely that it's going to be wind or solar. And that's what this graph is showing you is that per unit cost of electricity, wind and solar are now cheaper than any other form of new build power station. So the transition is happening. Um, it hasn't been pushed in Australia by our federal government, but the states have gotten involved um, and Victoria has some really strong um, ambitions for renewable energy and it's been going at that for a few years now. And as part of that, it's been encouraging communities to, to, to get involved and, and through the community power hubs in particular. I think one of the questions that we have now in Australia is who's going to own that renewable? Who's going to benefit from the transition? How are we going to make sure that our people in our, in our regional communities where these incredible renewable energy resources are, how are they involved and benefiting? So how do we do it fast enough to meet the needs of climate change? But how do we also make it fair? And how do we take this once in a generation opportunity um, to, to develop our renewable energy resources in a way that strengthens our regional communities. That's what community energy is all about. And this is um, a picture diagram of where, where community energy fits in the scheme of things. So to meet um, good targets and to, to transition our economy and not just our electricity, but also our transport sector towards renewable energy, we need a lot of wind and solar capacity, as well as other forms of renewables, such as um, hydro and bioenergy, as long as we're um, aware and sensitive to, to what the, where the feedstocks are coming from. But I just wanted to show you this, this diagram. It shows that um, we, need, we need to do all we can at a household level. And Australians have been really great at taking up things like household solar and um, solar hot water and increasingly batteries and electric vehicles. And that's fantastic. We all need to do what we can in our own lives to cut emissions. But, um, and we also need some big projects. You know, we, we need to supply big power 
power hungry cities and industries. So we need some big projects, but there's also this scale in between that really makes a lot of sense for communities to get involved and to, to own renewable energy assets and to benefit from that. So in terms of what is community energy? Community energy is basically where a community comes together and they actively together develop and own um, a sustainable energy project. And they ben the, the benefits flow back, not only to the individuals involved, but also to the whole local community. And it might be um, generation, energy generation, such as renewable energy projects, but it also might be projects that are helping people become more energy efficient or to, to help manage the demand in the grid by um, installing a community-owned battery, for example, and doing a range of demand response um, activities. And it also can be community-based approaches to selling or distributing energy. So there's more and more of these, particularly as we, we um, see trials of microgrids and embedded networks, and we've got community-owned energy retailers such as Innova and Indigo Power. So there's more and more options, and it's a really diverse and exciting space. I'll just quickly talk through a few different possible, um, a few of the projects that are happening in Australia. This is a picture of a community funded solar array on a preschool. There's a lot of these kinds of projects where the community um, provides the finance and, and um, organises the install of solar on a community building of some kind. And over time, as that, as that community centre or the childcare centre saves money on their bills, the, the solar system is paid back and eventually this childcare centre will own the solar system. So it's a really fantastic, very simple model, but it's enabling people and organisations who can't afford it, the solar upfront to still access the benefits and to still get on board. This one, of course, uh, Victoria's famous project of Hepburn Wind, a really fantastic project, two turbines owned by 2,000 people, most of whom are local people. But from there, what's really great to see is that it's grown out and it's diversified and now um, Hepburn Wind, has, they're installing a solar farm. They're working with uh, lots of local organisations and the council to become, become a zero net emissions community. So it's really radiated out on these ripples of change and more and more people have gotten involved and they've gotten broader and broader ambitions and doing things like um, electric vehicle bulk buys and electric vehicle charging stations and um, so it can start in one place and grow and go really positive, positive ways. And this community now is really, you know, within it's, it's aiming for zero net emissions, which is a, a across energy, uh, heating and transport, which is a really amazing goal to be able to work towards. We um, might, this is a picture of a yep. We might just have to get okay. you to 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 sum up some of the important things there, Jarrah. I'm afraid we're running out of yeah. time. I'm afraid. No worries at all. So um, what I was going to show you, just to end on a really positive note, is um, that back in 2009, we had three community energy projects across the country. And if you fast forward to last year, we had over 70 operating projects and 134 groups across every state and territory. So the power of being able to come together, work on community energy, um, is definitely growing and I think a really positive way that, that we can work together to make a difference. Thanks. Thank you. And, and sorry to hurry you along there. Yeah, that was a great conference. I see the photo that you've got there on the screen. And 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 you're absolutely right. There, there, uh, I've been getting um, messages from people saying there's over $24 billion worth of renewable energy projects which are going on in Gippsland over the next few, you know, number of years. So the next 10 years, we're expecting about $24 billion worth. So it's just amazing how much is going on out there. Jarrah, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sorry I had to cut you short. Uh, I'll get you to turn your video off because I'm going to now move to a practical example of the farmers in Gippsland really taking up this kind of idea of, uh, of lowering their emissions. And we now bring us to, to Sandra, Sandra Jefford, who's uh, part of a farm in Clydebank, who's done some amazing things. So, Sandra, I'll get you to pop your video on and get on the screen. Sandra, if you're out there. I know Sandra's been working at Willandra uh, and she should be there somewhere. Uh, Sandra, uh, hello. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I'm not getting Sandra, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to go to Tammy. Uh, we'll go to Tammy Lo Logan. If you're there, Tammy, we'll get you to pop your video on if you could. That will be fantastic. There must be a problem with Sandra. Uh, Tammy, of course, is part of, of Gippsland Unwrapped. Anyway, I'll let you explain who you are, Tammy, and how you go. And I know your PowerPoint isn't working so well tonight, so we're going to go with a PDF, but I'm, I'm sure it'll be very exciting. So we'll let you have a crack okay. at that. Away you go, Tammy. We'll try. We'll see how the internet goes. Um, I've lost connection a couple of times already, so I'll try my best um, with this PDF. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I just want to share with you my story really about how um, I went through an experience about having some really big feelings about big environmental problems, which then led me to take some really small actions, which then ultimately led to a, a really big difference in my life, which um, turned out to be this blog, Gippsland Unwrapped, which um, a lot of people in Gippsland have heard about and um, some others around the country too. So uh, what ended up um, happening was back in 2014, I was experiencing something like eco-anxiety, although I probably didn't know it as that back then. Um, and I was someone who had always been mindful of their environmental footprint from a really young age and had always worked in sustainability and natural resource management. Yet I still found myself with this huge feeling, this huge sense of helplessness and um, feeling like there was nothing I could do except watch this huge environmental disaster unfold because not enough people cared about the environment to do something about it to do what we needed to do. So I found myself in a situation where I really didn't know how to handle these feelings. And I felt like I was doing everything that I already could, everything that was within my means. So I felt trapped by circumstances that I didn't have enough money or enough time or enough support to do anything else. So I was also angry at myself for not doing more because I always pictured myself as someone who would do whatever it takes um, you know so I was angry about not fighting harder for not being a role model for my kids who were about six and four at the time um, and you know for not not being mentally tougher or something like that so what I ended up doing was uh, looking for some things that I could do as a family that was going to help me feel like I was living more in line with my environmental values. So, um, and that would show the kids how much I cared for the environment in the hope that that value would be passed on to them as well. And I really had no idea what I was looking for at the time. I thought maybe some sort of um, volunteer citizen science type of opportunity somewhere. But then I stumbled across the Plastic Free July Challenge which was really small back then and I'd never heard of it before, but I started looking into it and um, I remembered about this workplace presentation we'd had about six months earlier about the problem of plastic in waterways and how devastating I'd been to learn about um, the amount of plastic in seabird stomachs. Um, so this actually seemed like a really good thing to do. And so for those people who don't know, the Plastic Free July Challenge is to refuse all single-use plastic for the month of July, just as a way to raise awareness about how much single-use plastic is in our lives. So yeah, I decided I was gonna do it and I decided to start straight away, which was actually in early June um, of 2015, I think it was by then. Um, so yeah, I thought it was perfect for me because it seemed like something I could do to make a difference, but wasn't actually going to take any more time or money away from my family. It was just really a matter of um, shopping differently, or so I thought. So I'll just take a drink. Now, I was pretty enthusiastic about the challenge. So I thought anything that I um, did throughout the month that was going to be easy, I'd just I'd keep that in my life. Um, and what's more is I recognised that, you know, my thrifty repurposing ways, uh, making things myself was going to add another layer of environmental benefit. So by repurposing material and making my own produce bags or bread bags, that was, that was adding a whole nother layer of environmental benefit. So I really 
began to feel empowered again throughout this challenge rather than feeling um, alone and angry and um, helpless. So even though I wasn't stopping plastic production in its tracks or, you know, on the world stage or anything like that, I definitely felt like I had some level of control and that it really was a, a form of protest and voting with my dollar and sending a message back up the chain that I didn't think um, single-use plastic was acceptable um, in most cases. And it really did feel good to be living more in line with my environmental values again and to be demonstrating this in front of my children because I think part of the problem before was that I might have been going off to work and doing things, but my kids didn't see any of that. So it was hard for them to kind of see how much I valued some things, um, some sustainability issues. So um, that's just some of the things that we do. So I decided to share my decision to um, do the challenge with my friends on Facebook. And I really did that just to be held publicly accountable and to see if anyone would do it with me. Um, and so they knew why I was doing weird things now, like refusing straws when we were going out. But something I didn't expect started to happen um, over the weeks of July as I posted updates about what sort of single-use plastic I'd been able to avoid and what things I hadn't been able to avoid. So first, and I'm, apologies, it's a little bit messy, but, you know, this is straight off my Facebook feed and blurring out people's names. First, um, people started to help me find the things that I was looking for without plastic, which was great. Then they started sending me messages saying things like, I went to the supermarket today and I thought, what would Tammy do in this situation? Or what would Tammy get instead of this? And then they started telling me how they had made a different choice or that they had noticed something that was really poorly packaged and that they were gonna complain about it. So like this made me really happy because first of all, I thought, you know, nobody was going to be supportive of me in this. They, I thought they were going to think I was a bit of a weirdo or something, but not only did I have their support, but they were really um, helping me out on this. And after a while, I realised that this is the power of leading by example and having conversations with the people around you. So whether it's on social media or in real life, um, our actions are helping other people to see sustainable behaviours as normal which is it increases the likelihood that they will adopt the behaviour to, um, to fit in. It's called social norms. So it's a really powerful thing that we can do um, by adopting sustainable behaviours ourselves. And reusable coffee cups are a great example of this. Um, in the past, these haven't been, um, you know, really, um, really out there, but now they're just hugely socially acceptable. Um, you might even say that disposable coffee cups are um, antisocial now. Now, so I did the challenge and um, I did it for the month. And at the end of Plastic Free July, I said to all of my friends, I'll stop boring you with all these updates, but I am going to try and continue to reduce all of my waste. And um, that's when a few friends suggested to me that I start a blog. And I uh, initially thought this was not something I was interested in because I knew there was a few other blogs out there, but um, I actually didn't see my situation or circumstances reflected in those blogs. So I didn't connect with them very well. And that got me thinking that that might be a good reason to start my own, thinking that there would be a few other Gippslanders out there who would be interested. Um, and it would be a great way to amplify the, um, my message and um, uh, the impact of my actions. So it wasn't just me that other people could see, see this and um, learn what I was doing and, and how to do them. So, um, so yeah, I had no idea how to start a blog or I'd never knowingly read a blog before. Uh, so I just got on to Google and started a free WordPress site and that's still the same one I use today. And these are just some of the examples of some of the different things that I have covered on the blog about how to reduce waste. So um, blogging turned out to be a really great decision, another really simple, small decision that I made because now I've had 1.3 million views from all around the world, um, which has led to newspaper, magazine, podcast, radio, and other blog features, as well as school, local government, um, business and community group presentations. 
So my conversations about how we are reducing waste um, and trying to encourage a shift towards a more circular economy has really been amplified. Um, and the feedback I've had from others um, has encouraged them, um, tells me that they have encouraged, been encouraged to check their lives and, and reduce their waste. Am I getting the wind up, Darren? Yes, we might have to just cut to the chase, I'm afraid. Okay, yes, um, I'm getting there. Um, yeah, so, uh, so in addition to this, it became really enjoyable to um, try and find as many waste-free solutions as possible to the things in our life. And I did that basically by following this waste hierarchy. And um, this leads to things like reducing how much we consume in the first place. So we might be thinking about how we rent or share something um, instead of buying it for ourselves, looking for package free options, uh, giving things more life by reusing, repairing, repurposing and that sort of thing. Um, and when there's no life left in something, then we look at recycling or composting. And so the result of that um, change was that I could fit one year of waste in a one litre jar with a bit of space still. And each member of my family um, had this one year challenge and their own one litre jar and they were all able to fit their waste in the one litre jar, except for my husband who had a little bit of stuff popping out of the top there, a bit of overflow. So um, when you compare that to the average family who can fill a three bedroom house with the amount of rubbish they throw away each year, um, I think you'd all agree that that is a really big difference that has added up just from small everyday actions um, and that says to me that um, with a bit of know-how and commitment as a society we can already make a fairly big difference and I'll just finish on this slide because I want to point out that um, I don't think that we should be relying on individual action to change the world because definitely government and business can be very uh, much more impactful but small everyday actions by individuals um, shows government and business that we are ready and waiting for the change. Excellent, Tammy. That's exactly because right. As as the internet is starting to, we're starting to lose the internet. Who uh, on? Great job, Tammy. Well, there, that's right. We might get you to, if you can, just to stop sharing your screen there. Uh, if not, I'll do that for you. Stacey. <laughs> yeah, good work. We missed a bit of that, Tabby, because your, your Puong internet is starting to black out. So I'll get you to stop sharing the screen. We'll give you a huge round of applause and thank you very much for demonstrating how people on the ground can do things. Now I'm going to try again to get Sandra up and about. Oh, that is amazing. Good work. Sandra, from your farm in Clydebank, tell us a little bit about what you're doing uh, to uh, do your bit for Gippsland, reducing its emissions. I'm just trying to, there we go. So can you see that? I can indeed, but we're not in presentation mode yet. Okay. That's perfect. That is really, really good. I'll leave you to it. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'm going to tell you a bit about our organic dairy farm business, our alternate energy project, and some of the ways we're trying to improve our natural resources. I farm with my husband, Wilco, our son, Luke, and staff. Our home farm is about 900 acres near Sale. We milk about 300 cows year round, and that's pretty much an average size herd. Our milk is sold to Kai Valley Dairy Company in Geelong and used to make the true organic butter and a two litre organic milk available in Aldi. We have an annual rainfall of about 600 mil. But this year, the rainfall is already up to 690 mil here, which is very welcome. We would normally irrigate from September to May, pumping water from the Avon River and from Boars. About 400 acres of the farm has good irrigation. Pumping this water means big energy use and big bills. That also means that we have quite a lot of dry land and land for wildlife. So we moved to this farm about 10 years ago, and I was quite shocked at the energy use and the bills. 
So in 2018, we had an irrigation audit conducted and the following year, a dairy energy audit was done. Like many farms that have grown over the years, we have a number of titles and electricity meters. That's important in relation to where power is generated and used. Farm generated power can't currently go across title lines. Back then we were using about 500,000 kilowatts a year. In February this year, AGVIC approved our project proposal submitted to the Agriculture Energy Investment Plan and work is now well underway. Our first step was to modify or change equipment so we needed less power, then install alternate energy equipment. So this photo here is our first 50 kilowatts of ground mounted solar. And in the background, you should just be able to see the sheep which are trying to control the grass around the panels. Once fully operational, we'll have 229 kilowatts of solar panels across three sites on the farm and two 15 kilowatt wind turbines that should generate most of the power that we need with some battery storage to smooth power going into the grid. We'll still be very dependent on the grid and we won't be off grid. Energy and irrigation management systems have been developed by AEI in Morwell and they will direct the alternate energy to where it can be used. We're aiming to match farm operations to the power when it's available, which is a major reason for our project receiving government investment. Farm operations are currently not well matched to solar power. We currently try to run things on off-peak power, like irrigation and hot water heating. A proposed farm microgrid trial could enable power to be generated at three sites and used at multiple sites around our business. This trial was highly regarded by Osnet when we were developing the project, but now it seems it's a low priority for them. For us, it's still critical. There are many farms and regional communities that would benefit from the microgrid. The concept need, needs to be tested and assessed widely and thoroughly. Microgrids are regarded as important at a federal level, where they've just allocated $50 million to the Regional Australia Microgrid Pilots Program. So if you support the concept of our trial microgrid and you know someone in Osnet, can you help us? In the dairy, there are several imp improvements underway to reduce chilling, milk, heating water and the wash cycle. So there's also a community project about live pricing. This involves 10 irrigation farms and at each site, an AEI smart box will control an irrigation pump. At times of high demand, oh, sorry, at times of electricity oversupply, that is when power needs to be dumped from the grid, farmers can help by taking power out of the grid and use the power to pump water into their dam. At times of high demand for electricity, for example, when the temperature is say over 40 degrees, we can take less power out of the grid and contribute what we can. The result will be that farmers receive lower power costs on the meters involved and feel good about helping the energy community. If this happened on a broad scale, residential customers would be less likely to be affected by blackouts and the retailers wouldn't have to buy as much expensive power or draw on their insurance. The grid generation capacity also wouldn't have to be increased as much as it otherwise would. So that covered our alternate energy project. Now I'm going to move on to um, soil improvements. Soil is our biggest asset and its health will be even more critical in the future, yet we know so little about it. It's well known that healthy soil leads to healthy plants and animals, which results in nutrient dense food, which leads to a healthier population. But common farming practices such as frequent cultivation, bare soil and the use of synthetic fertilizers have not been kind to the soil. But some of these practices are still recommended and widely utilized. Reducing the number and diversity of soil microbes means nutrients aren't, transpo aren't transported into plants which means they're deficient in nutrients. Hence, the populations need to take mineral supplements. 
Grazing management also has a big, big impact on soil health. Grazing animals are critical to soil carbon sequestration. We do need ruminants, even if they do burp out methane. We aim to extend the number of days between grazings, giving plants time to build larger root systems, as well as more leaves above the ground. We need to diversify plants and soil microbes. Many farmers are planting multi-species crops, which benefit the soil microbes, grazing animals and insects, which also means more birds. And the photo that I have here includes things like crimson clover, brassica, and a number of cereals. There was also chicory and plantain. So that's what I mean about a multi-species pasture. We've begun a soil carbon project and the deep soil testing that we've done showed that we have plant roots down to 110 centimetres. If we can increase soil carbon, our soil will hold more water and we'll have a bit more resilience in dry times. We have the goal of being carbon neutral within five years. The UN has declared this the decade of ecosystem restoration. Unfortunately, there seems to be very little recognition of this. The photograph is on our morass near the Avon River, where we've fenced off quite a large area of ancient red gums. We aim to plant thousands of trees to provide shade and shelter for our cattle, improve farm value, increase biodiversity and carbon storage. So far, with some help from the West Gippsland CMA, we've fenced off about 15% of the home farm to improve water quality and protect habitat. One wetland area is home to eight species of frogs, including the endangered growling grass frog and green and golden bell frogs. We don't know much about the current wildlife on our farm. So how will we know what changes? We'd love to know more about the soil microbes, insects, reptiles, birds, and marsupials. Around the world, we've seen incredible change in relation to the pandemic. Now we'd like to see the same action relating to global warming. We ask our politicians to make this a priority now don't wait, hoping for new technology in the next decade. Agriculture can be a big part of the climate change solution. Farmers are helping to slow global warming, or farmers can help to slow global warming, but not if it's their business as usual. Landowners will need support to change, such as grazing advice, new soil science and carbon calculations. Landowners will probably also need subsidies or better prices paid for their food and fibre, which does not currently cover the true cost of farming and what we provide, such as habitat protection, flood mitigation and carbon sequestration. At a regional, national and international level, we need to plant more trees and have better levels of ground cover and maximise soil carbon. In relation to cow methane emissions, can it be measured at the farm level in the future? Do different plant species reduce emissions? And when can we all get access to the asparagopsis that's being trialled at Ellenbank? More science is required. Most farm vehicles are based on diesel. When will there be alternatives? And are they going to be affordable for your average farmer? We've learned so much through Landcare. We really value this organisation and would like to see more secure funding and more positions supported. At the moment, Landcare is perhaps the main delivery of agri regenerative agricultural practices. I also recommend more regional farm demonstrations to help farmers adapt. In conclusion, I don't claim that we're doing everything right, but we're learning and having a go. I also recognise the other efforts of local farmers who are happy to share what they're doing and we really appreciate their help and friendship. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate very much what you're doing down there. It's an absolute um, amazing thing. And we might stop you from sharing just there a minute, Sandra, so I can see Darren. I'm welcoming Darren. I'm really understanding that he has to leave us uh, shortly. Um, Darren, you've been listening to what Sandra and others have been talking about. Um, firstly, your, your response to a lot of that. Thanks, Darren, and thanks to all the presenters. 
I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll start briefly where you finished, Sandra, in relation to land care and what I think is, is the broader challenge for us here in Gippsland is that we are custodians for a vast public land estate in our region and governments over the past 20 years have gutted the, the workforce on the ground. We actually need more boots and less suits. We need more boots on the ground doing that practical environmental work you talked about and less suits making excuses for why it can't happen. And that's a real challenge for us to get that to happen. So land care is part of it, but also the public land estate needs more resources to improve that resilience. So, you know, what we saw with the bushfires two years ago, part of the problem there, I mean, obviously we come out of drought and, and some climate issues related to that, but also the tracks, the trails, the infrastructure around towns wasn't protected. They hadn't, they hadn't done the fuel reduction work to um, protect our towns or our, or our households. So that was a real issue for us. So I do really believe we need more resources on the ground to help us. And I don't think anyone in the community in Melbourne is going to object to people in Gippsland having jobs in natural resource management. If it's going towards biodiversity measures, improving the ecosystem. And you've seen uh, in the Cal's Irrigation District, Sandra, you talked about some of the work you've done, just a little bit of investment to help farmers with whole of farm management plans result in a massive reduction in the amount of nutrients going off their properties into the lakes, and into, sorry, into the rivers and into lakes. So farmers want to do this. Farmers want to adapt. But if they get research and it's proven and it's shared with them, uh, they will adapt and they will use those proven technologies because it makes their problems more, more productive anyway, but also does a bit for the environment. So I think what you're doing is fantastic. And the same to you, Tammy and Jarrah. I think the community power shared the community power models, and, and there's a lot of interest in that across our region, particularly, I think, for the rural and remote communities, which will, might even improve the resilience of their energy supply. But, Tammy, I wouldn't lose heart if I was you. What you've done is incredible in terms of taking action. There's an old saying about do as much good for as long as you can, and what you've done is a lot of good for a lot of people and showing people that, you know, your practical action can make a real difference. And I think when I get around Gippsland, you know, people say, oh, it's a safe National Party seat. They'll always like the National Party. It's conservative. I don't even know what conservative means anymore. I mean, people in Gippsland care about the environment. They want to see us doing our bit to look after future generations. They're not, um, you know, Neanderthals who think that they can keep on taking stuff out of the planet and never, do, never putting anything back. I, I just don't get that sense when I talk to people in my community. So um, it's not a, I don't think it needs to be an us versus them debate anymore. We're going to try and find some sensible ground in the middle where we can work together positively to do the things that really make a difference. So, no, I do appreciate your time tonight, Darren. I'm happy yep. to do any questions. Sorry, yeah, no, I, I, I will give you one question if you don't mind, and I appreciate you coming back and being able to do that. And I know there's a stack of them. I'd like to get Artie onto the stack. I think it's important to have a young person perhaps to, to, to put their views forward. I mean, it's their future in some regards. Artie, are you, are you there with us? Can you um, make yourself seen? Artie's speaking to us, I think. From yes, hello. G'day, Artie. I'm, I'm going to get you to talk a bit more extensively after Darren's gone, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it on you to ask a question of Darren uh, as a young person here tonight. What, 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 what would you like to see happen? What, do you, what are your aspirations? What do you think is important? Um, I think we need to be doing a lot more, firstly. And so I just want to say that to Darren and make that known that young people think the Australian government is not doing nearly enough. And net zero by 2050 is pretty much an absolute joke as far as the young community in Gippsland is concerned. Uh, and so your question, Artie, is about what's the, what can the federal government do more to, 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 to lift a... My, okay, my question for Darren, for Darren Chester will be that why do you think what we're doing currently is acceptable? Okay. Well, I said, thanks, Artie. Look, I said in my, in my opening comments that um, there is, a, there is a, I think, a real need for us to be more optimistic than perhaps some of the media coverage of this issue. Australia is reducing its emissions in line with its international commitments. You're saying we need to make big commitments. I understand that's a point of view you can, you can take. But we actually have to bring the community with us. And what we've seen over the past probably 15 years, back to the John Howard era, is at a federal level, this is one area of public policy which has deeply divided the parliament to the point where we haven't been able to reach agreement on a whole range of topics. For the first time, there's agreement on net zero emissions by 2050, and it wasn't easy getting some of my colleagues there, I can assure you. Uh, that is a significant step forward. I think as you, as you see proven technologies developed and adapt and, and used across Australia in the coming years, we're going to get to a lower, lower figure quicker than people expect, just as we're going to by 2030. 
the challenge of the yard is, is, is making sure that we respect everyone's point of view on the way to this position, but also respect the people who are involved in industries, which are probably going to lose their traditional jobs and have to transition to new jobs. And when you start using the word transition, I saw one of the comments in the, um, in the chat before. The word transition in the past in regional communities has been code for you don't have a job anymore. When governments have made decisions about transition in Gippsland in my lifetime, the last 25 years, Looking back in the region, they've done a transition on the timber industry, on the fishing industry, on irrigated agriculture. It's been a transition to unemployment. So you go to Orbost and you say, well, 25 years ago, the government promised new jobs for people in the timber industry. Now there's one football team in Orbost. There used to be two. Uh, the town has been devastated by those decisions and the new jobs haven't been produced. So we have to bring the community with us when we talk about transition because people you know, want to still live in those regional communities. They want to have... Uh, jobs in those communities enjoy the lifestyle they choose to live in those regions for a reason and you have to bring them with you and in when when you talk about uh doing more i think there's an appetite to do more as long as you can continue to provide that reliable affordable energy you can provide the food you need and the transport tasks that our country faces so these aren't easy questions that i'm pretending there's an easy answer it's not this whole discussion is, is an environmental issue but it's much bigger than that it's social it's economic it's cultural and it's recognising that we're going to achieve more as a country if we can to unite our country rather than go back to left versus right throwing bricks at each other. Yeah, I, th I think I think what we've been discussing tonight is that Gippsland has a huge future in this space. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right, Darren, that if we can bring the community along with us on the environmental journey, that there are certainly jobs to be had that farmers can, can have more sustainable land, that individuals can do more by reducing their waste, and, and maybe young people have a more positive sense about living here within our, in our beautiful place. Um, Darren, I just really like to appreciate you coming out tonight. It's not easy to, to, to get here and discuss in the environment. I know that that's made you somewhat unpopular within your party and, and I'm sure there are some here tonight that would like to see you do more as well, but I appreciate that you're standing up and, and having a conversation. I really do. Uh, thanks, Darren. There's a couple of quick ones I'll try and answer on the chat. Kate, asked am I better to be an independent look it's a fair question Kate it's one that uh, has kept me awake at night I can promise you that my my undertaking to the people of Gippsland was I was a national party candidate at the last election and I can finish this term as national party member and I've been endorsed uh, by the nationals to contest the seat the only point I'd make Kate in relation to that is politics is, is ruthlessly about the numbers and regional people need to work together to get the numbers to try and influence policies and the National Party or the Country Party, as it was at its best, was good at doing that. But I had, I've had some real issues with some of my Queensland colleagues, which have been well publicised. And I acknowledge um, that it's difficult to see uh, how we'll reconcile those differences. Um, but I think that regional Australia needs a strong voice, but it needs a sensible and respected voice. And that's what I'm trying to achieve as a Gippslander. Um, uh, transition to power industry, you agree? Someone asked about transition to power industry. The question all the way through for me on the power sector is about reliability and affordability while still meeting your emissions targets. And that's treating the workers in that industry with a great deal of respect and not having those precipitous closures like we had with Hazelwood. That caused enormous disruption in the community. So giving people a longer period of time to adjust is a much better, um, a much better approach to the, question, to, the, um, to the power industry issues. Um, and there's a lot of questions to you, Sandra, so you can answer all those, but you're spot on about land care and practical, practical resource management, natural resource management. We should be putting an enormous amount of more resources into our catchment management authorities for people on the ground to do the work and then going to land care and saying you're going to have more coordinators to leverage off the community effort because the community, if it's given that support, will want to do more work, more tree planning, more riverine, um, riparian banks, restoration, more pest plant animal control. The, the community is screaming out for it, but we don't have enough resources of actual workers on the ground working alongside the community. I think that's a real opportunity for local, state and federal government to work together on. And I've taken too much of your time, Darren. I apologise. No, 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 no. Darren, we could, we could have you for much longer, and I hope we do in the, in the future. And I know that we'll be keen to talk to you more about what's going on. Darren, thank you for tonight. Thank you very much for giving us some time. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll say goodbye to you, and uh, we'll talk again. Uh, thank meanwhile, you. Thanks, mate. Good on you. I'll ask the other panellists to join us if they could. We've still got a ways to go. Actually, before I, 
I do that. Artie, I'm going to get you back. You're a young person that organised the climate strike in Bansdale. Uh, you're prepared to ask the tough questions. Um, Artie, if you could come back on. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get your chance to do your full speech while Darren was there, but I just wanted him to at least answer some of the questions from the chat room. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background as a young person? What do you see in Gippsland? What do you see are the priorities um, um, for young people yeah, sure. and for all of us? Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's no problem at all. I think I'm giving Darren the opportunity to speak because it's well worth it for sure. So as you mentioned, yeah, I'm the Young Person representative for this event uh, and I um, organised the Bansdale Climate Strike in 2019. I uh, grew up in Gippsland. I went to high school in Bansdale and I'm currently studying uni in Melbourne. Just a bit of background on myself. And I've witnessed the effects of climate change firsthand on my mother's farm with drought. And my childhood home was actually lost to the 2019 fires. So I'm pretty passionate about this issue. And what I'm doing personally to combat climate change is I have my own clothing brand that's focused on sustainability and is 100% sustainable. So uh, because the fashion industry is very bad for the world at the moment, there's millions and millions of tons just put into the ground, basically or burnt in other countries, which is a huge impact in climate change. So I'm trying to do my part to kind of better the industry. And I don't want to say too much because I just want to leave time for questions. Well, we've, we've, how are you going there? We Great. Excellent stuff. I might call the other panellists in now if we could. Uh, that would be great. Uh, so Sandra and Tammy and, uh, and Jara uh, to come back in there again. Um, and... Uh, and so I might, you've heard um, Artie speak, you've heard everybody else. F firstly, to you, Jara, um, responses by governments and where things are going. I, you've heard Darren talk. Uh, what are your feelings about all that? Oop, we've lost Jara just at that vital moment. Um, okay, I'll come back to Jara a bit later on. Um, um, she's is muted. Ah, uh, she's muted. There you go. You're, you're muted, Jarrah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. I can hear you now. So, okay. Uh, so just uh, just give us your response to to some of the things that government's doing about uh, COP26. Sure. Um, I am. I think that Australia, the way that we've approached the negotiations and the targets that we've taken to the COP, has been disappointing since the very first meeting. Um, I think that. Uh, I, I'm, to be honest, it makes me embarrassed. <laughs> I don't think we're aiming high enough at all. We are an incredibly privileged country. We have the resources, we have the knowledge. All we lack is the political will. There's even a strong groundswell of support for ambitious targets. I think um, the government has played politics with the issue of climate change for too many years now, and it's inexcusable, and it makes me really angry, to be honest. I am grateful and I think it's positive that the state governments are picking up some of the slack. Um, and I think that communities, as communities, we just need to continue to put the pressure on the government, on the federal government particularly. Um, we need to stand with the youth who are making their voices heard. And um, we need to, as a community, accept that we have everything we need to embrace a positive future. If we act now, that future is is going to be better than it is now. We don't have to give up anything. You know, we don't have to give up our quality of life. We just have to make um, we just have to make choices about doing things differently. And and it can, change can be scary, but you know, let's embrace it. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, so, Sandra, same question to you. What, what, what are your message to government? I know you had a number of messages within your talk, uh, but what, what are the key points for you as far as our response to, to um, what's happening in Glasgow right now? Um, I think it's really disappointing what Australia offered in Glasgow. Um, uh, you did ask me previously about carbon credits. So if I could just comment on that, we started the soil carbon project, but it is terribly expensive. It's uncertain because we don't know to what extent we're going to be storing the extra carbon in the soil. Um, and we don't know if we do store carbon, should we cash in those carbon credits 
or would we be better holding those in a carbon account because who knows whether we're going to need those credits in the future. Um, the people making the money really at the moment are the people helping the farmers with the, the projects because it's so complicated trying to do it by yourself. Well, one other thing that's come, one of the only real things that come out of uh, Glasgow has been this methane emissions, cutting to methane emissions. And let's not um, minimise that. Methane is an incredibly dangerous um, compound in terms of its you know, greenhouse gas um, implications. Barnaby said we had to shoot all our cattle. You're a, you're a dairy farmer. Um, do we have to do that to reduce our methane emissions? No, because I know you want milk in your coffee and you'd love some good cheese. <laughs> so, no, there are already grazing businesses across Australia that are carbon neutral um, because they know that they can sequester the carbon in the soil and that is balancing the methane emissions. And that's where we hope to get to. I know the dairy industry actually has been very proactive in this and have really reduced their emissions over a number of years. It's quite an exciting story what's happening in dairy, isn't it, Sandra? Um, across meat and dairy. Yeah. I think um, the, the meat industry is actually ahead of dairy. Oh, okay, okay. Um, they've got much stronger targets. They aim to be carbon neutral by 2030. Oh, really? So the meat industry will be carbon neutral yeah. by 2030? That's their goal yep wow um uh, tammy boots you you were really big on on individuals taking responsibility for their personal action and you took responsibility for what was happening in your life and formed a, a blog and minimized your own waste D i mean is it about individual communities or is it about governments what what are your response to what's happening in, in cop 26 um yeah so a really, um, I don't think it should all fall on our shoulders. I think they definitely need to play a bigger role. Um, I really just wanted to make the point that individual action um, is a way of, of giving people hope. And it's also a use shift that we need as a society. Um, and so I don't think this idea that technology is going to solve all of our problems um, is going to work because as I don't believe that that on its own can create that values shift that we need as a society just to say that, you know, new technology is going to um, provide all the answers. Technology on its own is not going to provide that value shift that we need. Um, whereas something like... Um, small individual actions, having conversations with all the people around you, it changes people's hearts and minds and brings whole communities along. And that's the kind of change that we need to see um, uh, to, to really make the big difference that we need to reach um, the kind of climate action that we need to see. Yeah. Um, Artie, I might, I might go to you if you want. There's been some questions here on the, ch on the question um, and I'm sorry that some of them are quite complex. So I, I'm, I'm trying to um, summarise those. But there's questions about forestry and uh, the critical importance of forest as a major solution to climate moderation. Um, this one comes from an anonymous question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, and the question in regards to the logging industry and so on. Now, um, you're currently... And I'm sorry to hear it, mate, but you said about you, 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 were, you were burnt out during the fires. Um, what are your opinions in regard to forestry management? I know Darren mentioned it several times. Uh, what's your opinion in regard to the way we manage our forestry industry and, and manage our natural wildlife, natural habitat? Oh, you froze at the wrong moment. Uh, um, well, in regards to forestry, I Whoop, Artie, yeah, I'm assuming you're out there somewhere or we just lost you, there you are. Maybe turn your video off so we can hear you at least, mate. Yeah. Is, it, is it working now? Yeah, no, you're cutting in and out. So maybe just cut your video off and we can just hear your voice. That'll be sure, fine. Sure, sure. Can, yeah. can everyone hear me? All yeah, right. we can hear you now, mate. Yeah, I just turned my video off, so hopefully that fixes it. Yeah. I think in terms of, I just want to touch on what, Darren said about the um the fires and how they were basically caused by not enough fuel reduction burns. 
and how that's completely false and the facts and all the data scientific data behind fuel reduction burning is that it doesn't work and it's effectively climate change drying out our forests more and more and that is making the fires more and more intense so fuel reduction burning doesn't cause anything doesn't solve anything rather as hot fires if you know anything about fires they burn in the canopy and not at the ground level so, so in terms of the resource management you're you're comfortable living in an area which has extensive forestry you're happy with that uh, in terms of the actual forestry industry, I was just talking about fuel reduction burning then. Yeah. Uh, the forestry industry... I acknowledge the forestry industry definitely needs to continue because wood is a great resource and is a huge industry for, well, a, an industry for Victoria and Australia. But I think the logging of old growth forests and, you know, trees are our greatest natural asset when it comes to combating climate change because they literally store the carbon themselves. And these old growth forests that are continually being logged are effectively, they're releasing all this carbon and the land clearing, it's a huge um, contributor to climate change. So the yep. logging of old growth forests, I think definitely needs to cease. And we need to move to more, way more sustainable forestry methods. And I can talk about this firsthand as in Goongra where my property was fire affected. They're actually continually they're continuing to log the fire affected old growth forests, even though it's fire affected. So in terms of young people, I'd like to get a, a bit of a sense about you, you organise the climate strike in Bansdale. What was the general feeling of, of young people? What, what are they, what are they wanting? What's their, what's their kind of demands of your life? Um, in regard to, to climate change to, and what the government's doing. Action on climate change or forestry? Yeah. Uh, uh, action on um, climate change more generally. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think the general consensus with young people, not just in Gippsland, but almost countrywide, I would say everyone that I know, all my friends and everything, everyone that I've kind of come into contact with, recognises that climate change is the biggest issue facing our generation and that our government's not nearly doing enough and is basically just putting the money for the mining corporations and fossil fuels ahead of everything. So, so listening to listening to tonight and just what some of the speakers are doing, the, the farming, what do, what do you think that we as Gippslanders should be doing? So what, I mean, we can talk about what our politicians should be doing, but what we, sh what we should we be doing as Gippslanders? As Gippslanders, I think one of the first things we should be doing is just looking at ourselves individually. So stuff like Tammy's doing is really great. And I encourage people to, you know, recycle more and cut down on all their waste and stuff, because that really is the first step. We all need to start doing that. And I think another really simple thing that everyone can do if they're not already is either get solar power or renewable energy or switch your power plan to a green power plan. So it's a little bit more expensive, but you know, that's where the future needs to be. And the power companies need to see that the demand for green power is way outweighing the fossil fuel industry. Now, can I just, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to, to put it a plug here, but you're, you said you had a range of sustainable clothing. So what, what does that mean? What, yes, that's correct. Yeah, what, what do you mean by that? What, do you, what does that entail? Yeah, so I, um, I'm really passionate about design. That's what I'm studying at uni, business and design. And I was well aware that the fashion industry kind of worldwide is very, very bad for the environment, basically. It's all like, you know, Kmart, like $5 tees and stuff is just not sustainable at all. It's pretty much the cheapest and nastiest way to make clothes, basically. And I was, look, I just, I was um, researching about sustainable clothes and I couldn't really find any, anything online. There's not really any sustainable clothes, meaning, you know, they treat their employees well and stuff like that but they're not actually sustainable. There's almost no carbon neutral clothing brands. So I just thought I would start my own. So that gave me the idea of Kill, which is my brand Kill. It's kind of, it's called Kill because the aim is to kill fast fashion. So it um, is all 100% carbon neutral, sustainable blanks, all from ethical sources. And shipping is also all, all carbon offset. Wow. That, well, uh, and, and, I, and that's wonderful. So you 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 started up this 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 brand as a as a nineteen year old. Um, 
Yes, that's see. right. Wow. Go for I it. I think mate. also part of my part of my mission with the brand is kind of bigger than just my brand and clothing. It's to do with the sustainability of kind of industry as a whole and showing people that because I feel like a lot of people, businesses especially, like to say that it's too hard to transition to renewables or to being sustainable. And I kind of would like to call them out on this and say, well, I don't really agree. I think, yes, it does cost more, but it's definitely not impossible. We have the technology and the facilities now, and it really is now or never. It's now or never. I might um, finish off with all the speakers because we're getting close to our, our closing time. Um, I might start just by going around the panel, just like their final reflections, anything they'd like to say, anything that's coming out of tonight. Tammy, I'm going to start with you. Um, any final reflections on tonight? Anything you'd like to leave? Any key messages you'd like people to remember? Um, yeah, I just want to um, say to people, just start somewhere. So if you were in a situation like I was, just start somewhere because doing something is always um, to do better next time. So even if you don't continue with what you're doing, um, you are in a better position next time to keep going. You are inspiring just by being you. So, um, and you never know where that can lead, um, which is amazing. And I've heard some, you know, great stories from people who've contacted me and just, you know, it's just fantastic to, to find out about those sorts of things. And you don't often find out about them. So I would just keep that in mind, just start somewhere, do something, and you are inspiring people you don't even know. Good point. Okay. Sandra, I'll okay. go to you. Sandra, I'll go to you. <laughs> What, um, uh, what are the messages for tonight? Think about the food that you're buying and try and buy local because that's going to support local jobs and try and learn about the food that you're buying. Very echoey. Um, right again. So, uh, try and buy local food. Think about what you're buying and when you're thinking about things like uh, red meats, Australian meat is much more likely to be pasture raised, say, than beef in the US. And so much of the pu publicity about methane emissions is coming from the animals in the US. The Australian meat industry is quite different. Very good. Good point. Um, Jara, we'll go to you. And uh, I've muted you there, Jara, so you're going to have to unmute yourself. But um, uh, oh, anything I, that you can add tonight? Well, I just so appreciated hearing from all of the other speakers. And I think it's uh, what we've heard tonight on the panel is just a really lovely example of the different layers of action that we can take um, in our lives. We can follow our passions. We can do things in our, in our households and we can do things together and we can be conscious about um, conscious about the choices that we're making in everyday life and realise that they, they actually are radical acts of solidarity with the biosphere and, um, yeah, and caring, caring for our planet and each of us. And we'll finish with a young person. Artie, I'm going to finish with you. Any final messages to old people like me who have stuffed the planet, basically? You've got any quest anything that you'd like to say? Oh, my final comments would be just kind of, it's great that you recognise climate change is an issue and that you're trying to combat it and help my generation. So thank you and keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Keep fighting the good fight. Tonight has been a presentation of the Community Power Hub. We thank all of our speakers for speaking tonight and our member, Darren Chester, who spoke earlier. To Tammy, to Sandra, to, uh, to Jarrah and to Artie, thank you so, so much for being part of this, this conversation. And to all of those people on board, don't forget this is part of the Community Power Hub, which we are looking at projects within your local community. If you'd like to speak to us about a good idea you have, whether it's putting a solar on the roof of your local hall or building a resilience project or doing something in your own house, we'd like to hear about it. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, also a reminder that GCCN will be hosting another webinar with Greg Mullins, who is the New South Wales Fire Commissioner, or used to be a fire rescue commissioner, I should say, and he's got a book out which talks about climate change and forest fires. 
a really interesting talk. It's a webinar happening on the 29th of November as part of our AGM. I thank again the speakers. Thank you very much for tonight and for everyone participating. We will send you a link to a recording of this if you want to hear it again or tell your friends about what we talked about. Please keep fighting the good fight and, uh, and support each other as we move forward. Thank you, Gippsland, and good night. <laughs>